This video is about labour demand and supply, including where it's derived from and what might cause it to shift. So it's easy to forget that the market for labour is in many ways actually a market just like any other. So just like product markets, the price, or in this case, the wage for labour is determined by the market forces of supply and demand. And we're going to look at the demand side of that first. But before we get there, we first really need to understand what we mean by marginal productivity theory. So we'll start off then with the marginal physical product of labour, which is the extra output that's generated when an additional worker is employed. So that firm employs one more worker, how much extra output is going to be generated, which you can imagine is a pretty important figure that as a firm you would be interested in when you're making that decision on whether or not to employ that extra worker. But probably actually more important would be the marginal revenue product, so the MRP, which is the extra revenue that's generated when that additional worker is employed. And that can actually be calculated by the MPP, the marginal physical product, multiplied by the marginal revenue. It should kind of make sense because the extra revenue this additional worker brings in is going to be the extra output that they produce, are responsible for adding, multiplied by the additional revenue that's brought in by each unit of this output. Now, we should already know that the demand for labour is a derived demand, which means it's demanded not for its own sake, but for the output that it produces. And remember that the demand for labour comes from the firms that are actually employing these workers. And as the employing firm, think about what you'll be interested in when you're determining how much labour actually to employ. And I would say the, the most important thing for you to look at would be actually the extra revenue that these workers are going to bring in. And so that means that the marginal revenue product curve, which is essentially showing the additional revenue that those additional workers are bringing in, will be equal to the demand curve for labour. And we could actually label that y-axis wage. And that's what we will label it when we when we carry on into labour markets. And we could label our MRP curve as being the demand curve for labour. And that's downward sloping because of the law of diminishing marginal returns. So as we add more and more labour to those fixed inputs, the additional output that's added will start to diminish. And actually, it takes this concave shape away from the origin because these diminishing marginal returns will accelerate as we continue adding more and more and more labour to those fixed inputs. So just like the demand curve for products and services can shift, the demand for labour, the MRP curve, will shift if there's a change in the conditions that affect the marginal revenue product. Uh, just before we get there, though, just thinking about the impact of a change in the wage rate, just be really clear that that will have the impact of moving along the marginal revenue product curve, that demand for labour curve, just like a change in the price of a product will move along the demand curve. So we're not looking at changes in wages here. We're looking at the factors that will cause that whole curve to shift. So in terms of those causes of the shifts in the MRP curve, remember that the MRP is made up of the marginal physical product multiplied by the marginal revenue. So first and foremost, if the marginal physical product changes, that is going to cause the marginal revenue product to shift. And the most obvious cause of that would be a change in productivity of workers. If the productivity of workers was to go up, that would increase the additional output that an extra worker will produce and that will therefore increase the marginal revenue product of that worker and other things being equal it will shift marginal revenue product curve to the right. It's just worth noting that the opposite will be the case and there will be a left shift of the marginal revenue product curve if there was a decrease in productivity and that would go in the other direction. The other thing then, based on the fact that marginal revenue product equals marginal physical product times marginal revenue, is that if we get a change in the price of the product being sold, then that will change the additional revenue from the sale of that product. So it will therefore change the marginal revenue. 
And so that will cause the marginal revenue product curve to shift as well. And the price of a product is determined by its own forces of supply and demand. So if, for example, there was an increase in the demand for the product that these workers are producing, that would increase the price of the product due to supply and demand in that market. And that will increase marginal revenue product and it will shift the demand for labor curve to the right. And again, it's just worth noting that every all of that will happen in reverse and to the opposite. If there was a decrease in the price of the product, that would therefore cause a left shift in the marginal revenue product curve and it would move further in this direction. And the similarities continue between these product markets and the market for labor, because just like we can have price elasticity of demand for products and services, which could be price elastic, price inelastic, we can also have wage elasticity of demand for labor, or we could call that price elasticity of demand for labor as well. So the wage elasticity of demand is just the responsiveness of the quantity demanded for labor to a change in the, in the wage rate. And just like with price elasticity of demand for products and services, there's going to be a few different factors that will affect this price elasticity of demand for labor or this wage elasticity of demand. So the first of those could be the availability of substitutes. And in this case, with substitutes, we'd probably be looking at things like capital. So the more easily labor can be substituted with capital, the more wage elastic that demand for labor is likely to be. And that's because if you were to get an increase in wages, that would be likely to lead to a big decrease in the demand for labor if it's very easy to substitute that labor with capital and with machinery instead, because the firm will just replace the workers with machinery rather than paying the higher wage. And that would make that situation more wage elastic. Another factor would be the labor cost as a proportion of total costs. So the higher the proportion of that labor cost, the more wage elastic the demand is likely to be. And that's because the bigger the proportion is of wages as a proportion of total costs for a firm. Um, it's got that big chunk of costs tied up in labor. So they're more likely to need to be making those cutbacks if there's an increase in wages. A firm which uses mostly capital and only a few workers won't be as worried about an increase in wages, won't have as much of an impact, and that would therefore likely to make the demand for labor more wage inelastic. And then finally, we've got the price elasticity of demand for the good being produced. And the more price elastic the demand for that good or service, the more wage elastic the demand for labor is likely to be. And that's because if you've got price elastic demand for the product, then you can't very easily pass those increase in wage costs onto the consumer because you just lose too many customers as a business. So you're more likely to need to respond by reducing the demand for labor, which will make it more wage elastic. Moving now then from the demand for labor onto the supply of labor, which is the number of hours that workers are willing and able to work at a given wage rate. And this is going to be affected by monetary and non-monetary influences. So starting here with the monetary influences, the first and probably the biggest one is going to be the wage rate that's offered in that particular occupation or industry. And it's the biggest one because that's the one that the supply curve is actually plotted based on. So if there's an increase in the wage rate, then we would have this movement up along the supply curve. And if there was a decrease in the wage rate, we would have this movement down along the supply curve. So changes in that wage rate because the supply curve is plotted against that on the y axis will lead to movements up or down along the upward sloping supply curve. And it takes that upward sloping shape because that is the impact of a change in the wage quite logically on the supply of labor to a, to a particular occupation. More workers are gonna be more attracted to an occupation by higher wage rates than they are by lower wage rates. But there are a few other monetary influences as well. And these other ones will cause the supply curve to shift either to the right or to the left, rather than that movement up or down along the supply curve. So if there was a change in the wage rate in alternative occupations, so if, for example, there was an increase in wages elsewhere, 
then suddenly this occupation that we're drawing this supply curve for looks less attractive. So the supply curve would shift to the left and the supply curve would shift to the right if there was a decrease in the wage rate in alternative occupations as this occupation now looks more attractive and so there's an increase in supply and that supply curve for labour shifts to the right. It'll also be affected by bonuses if there's more opportunities to gain bonuses then that could increase the supply of labour um, and again shift it in that rightward direction um, at any given wage rate. And then finally, we could look at the opportunities for overtime. So a lot of additional pay can be gained from working overtime, which is often paid at a higher rate than the standard wage rate. And so if there's more opportunities for overtime, that's likely to shift that whole supply curve for labour to the right. And then there's also these non-monetary influences that might cause that supply curve for labour to shift to the right or to the left as well. And just a few of these might include the amount of training that's needed for that particular industry. So the more training or the longer that takes, that's going to limit the supply of labour to that industry and it's likely to push that curve further to the left. The immobility of labour is a similar sort of point because if labour is more immobile, either occupationally, so it's more difficult to move between professions, that could be the case if there's more training that's required, or potentially as well geographically, which might mean that you can't move as easily between regions. Again, that's going to limit the supply of labour to that industry and it's going to push that curve further to the left. Job satisfaction and conditions could have an impact as well. So the greater the level of job satisfaction and the better the working conditions, um, that's going to increase the supply of labour to that industry. Uh, there are some occupations which actually pay quite poorly, but might have a lot of people who want to work in them because the conditions are so good and there's really good job satisfaction from working in those industries. So that's likely to shift that curve further to the right. And then the last one here we could look at might be opportunity cost of labour. So that's those other things that people could be doing with their time other than working. So those kind of leisure activities and the greater the opportunity cost. So basically the more things there is to do other than working, the lower the supply is likely to be for labour and the more that's going to push that supply curve further to the left.